Well, greetings, Pastor Eric from Zion Lutheran Church in beautiful, windy Redmond. I'm usually going to try to do these outside as we go through the Gospel of John. Um, however, it is uh, too windy outside. It's too blustery outside. So we're inside today for looking at the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. We'll talk a little bit about the background, about the structure and the first 18 verses is what we're going to look at um, today. And as we do that, think of this. How is it that we apply Scripture to uh, what we believe and think and feel and do today? Well, there's actually what we call an application bridge between then and now. And what we look for in Scripture is timeless principles that speak through the ages because they speak the truth. So when we look back at the Gospel of John, we're looking at the interpretation of what he says in the time in which he said it, and then we take implications for what that means for us today and what it means for us today is a personalization of what John said then with the timeless principles that are true throughout time because they continue to be true to the bridge, the interpersonal bridge, the application bridge to now. Interpretation, implication, and personalization. And that, that kind of helps um, kind of bridge that gap with what we're talking about in John 1, 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, John was the last gospel, as I said, that was written. And John has high literary Greek language and terms. John is almost very philosophic. Not only does he present to us pictures instead of a video like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but pictures to kind of look at not pick apart necessarily but kind of look at the deeper meaning of it you get some time with some of these pictures that john paints and part of the use of his words in the beginning was the word now any jewish person to whom he was writing would know in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and they would all of a sudden tie it into in the beginning, NRK is the, the Greek word for that. In the beginning was the word. Um, when people in John's time would have heard that, that would have perked up their ears because in a philosophic theological world in which God, John lived, they talked about things like the word, the logos. L-O-G-O-S is the Greek word for that too that you've heard. They were very philosophic. They were kind of highfalutin, um, maybe high class educated people to whom John was writing. And when he said in the beginning was the word, their, ear, their ears would have picked up because the word for them sometimes meant God's mind, what was in God's mind, the word. It was a very popular concept back then to think of the word being the mind of God or they sometimes thought it might be an idea in the mind of God. God has this reason in his mind that he wants to talk to us and message for his people. So maybe that's the word coming from the mind of God in the, in the, in the, in the minds of the hearers of John's audience. Um, the word also had behind it, besides an idea or the mind of God, something that was reasonable, something that upheld human virtue, something that came from um, philosophy. They had a lot of Greek people at John's time who loved philosophy, and they were always talking about things. Well, it could be like this, it could be like that. I majored in philosophy in college, you know, it's just kind of philosophical kind of thought and um, organizing the way that they talked about things, never really settling in. Philosophy is not always so practical, it's more philosophic. And so a few of their writings said that maybe it is the uh, logical stuff, it's the virtue that we're talking about with the word, the logos, mind of God, idea in God's mind, or something human um, virtue. or 
sometimes they talked about the word, the logos, as the eternal order behind all things. So in um, the Greek-speaking family, you're sitting there and a child says, where does the world come from? And the mom would say, well, from the word, from the eternal order behind things that brought things into being. So a lot of different ways in which these philosophical uh, Greeks, Jews, people of John's time, a lot of things that they thought about when they heard the word, word, in the beginning was the word. Um, for the Greek speaking person, to hear that is a, that's interesting. The world's been the word has been around from the very beginning. In the beginning, it was the word, and the word was with God. And then John says, and the word was God. All of a sudden, he's got those philosophical uh, Greeks and Jews in his um, in his court. And he's in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What came into being in him was life. And the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has, over, has not overcome it. Can't you just kind of feel the fluidity of his language, the beauty of the way that he writes? John writes in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now that's one that they wouldn't have heard of before. They would, they would have thought, wow. I know about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the mind of God. Then John hammers it home, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as the one and only Son of God. John um, wants to just say uh, to his Greek um, audience, to the Jewish audience, the high flute and audience, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He talks then about John, a man sent by John, and he uses courtroom language here. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. So we'll see a number of different times when there's almost, uh, Jesus is almost on trial all the way through the Gospel of John because people question him. Jesus answers, but not really. Then they question him again, and then Jesus answers, but not really. Um, he kind of keeps them on edge all the way through to just, um, to just kind of keep them on the, their feet, but also to keep engaging them. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world knew him not. John wants to tell the story of Jesus in such a way that that word in the beginning, in the mind of God, actions of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and um, we did not accept that. He talks about um, the, those who believed, in his, who believed in his name. He gave power to become children of God, born not of blood or the will of the flesh, but of God. To John's philosophic Greek Jewish highfalutin folks, this would all of a sudden be totally new stuff. So John writes in their language, catches them off guard, and presents Jesus to them. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. It's just a wonderful gospel. So start to look for some of that courtroom stuff, some of the questionings back and forth, kind of. There's all these sidebars happening in the Gospel of John. A little group goes off by itself and they say, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Then they go back to Jesus. So the whole thing is kind of a courtroom scene in which Jesus is um, really the judge, the presider over the whole experience. It's a wonderful Gospel. We'll get into um, chapter 2 tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit about why we're going to do that, skip over the rest of chapter 1, and get into chapter two. But before that, let's, um, our Jesus calling word for April 8th is like this. Once again, this Sarah Young writes this book as if it's God speaking. So let these words kind of roll over you. 
God says, I am with you and for you, your constant companion and provider. The question is whether you are with me and for me. Though I never leave you, you can essentially leave me by ignoring me, thinking and acting as if I am not with you. When you feel distance in our relationship, you know where the problem lies. My love for you is constant. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is you who change like shifting sands, letting the circumstance toss you this way and that. When you feel far from me, whisper my name. This simple act, done in childlike faith, opens your heart to my presence. Speak to me in love tones, prepare to receive my love, which flows eternally from the cross. I am delighted when you open yourself to my loving presence. And that is a big amen. Tune in tomorrow and we will continue. And uh, I hope it's just gonna kind of unfold in a wonderful kind of way as you really just fall in love with this gospel. I think you'll really love it so much. Thanks, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.